Right. Hello and welcome everybody to the Trinity Term weekly public seminar series at the Refugee Studies Center here at the University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Dilar Dirk and I'm a postdoctoral researcher and a course convener here at the Refugee Studies Center. And I'm convening this term series, which is titled Resistance, Justice, Liberation, Critical Approaches to Knowledge Production on War, Violence and Colonization. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers this term and there will be a range of them, including students and early career researchers who will present their work. And I will say a little bit about this term series and I will introduce the first seminar and its speakers shortly. Uh, before I do that, just a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Refugee Studies Center's YouTube channel. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end of this talk. And I kindly ask everybody to write their questions and comments on the Q&A function here on Zoom. And just to assure you, we will only update the speaker's presentation. The Q&A part will not be made available on YouTube. Um, as many of us know, in refugee and forced migration or migration studies, people often talk about the root causes of forced displacement and other forms of injustice. And it's clear that war and violence are at the heart of these things from violent colonial legacies um, and their ongoing impact on current moments to contemporary neo-colonial exploitation. It's crucial to develop um, critical analyses and explore also alternative solutions. Um, what are the systems and structures that of power that uphold exploitation and violence on a global scale? And how is that related to um, episodes of forced migration? And what are the ideologies that sustain and reproduce violence against racialized or minoritized and impoverished communities? And what if the things that are often presented to us as solutions are actually part of the problem? So hegemonic approaches in the world of humanitarianism are no exception to that, as the speakers today will also uh, explain. So uh, we're very excited about their contributions. And of course, uh, it must be said here that although there is much to worry about and there are many conflicts in the in different parts of the world and so much oppression and violence experienced by authorities, by non-state actors and by large scale systems of oppression, we should not despair because around the world there are also countless individuals and communities on the ground searching for methods and practices for liberation, uh, driven also by a desire to organize the world in a more just and egalitarian manner. So in this sense, uh, while critique is important, it's also more than meaningful to see and actively render visible the ways in which people come together and take steps to resist against oppression and violence and to build futures without war and exploitation to struggle for peace and justice. So the speakers in this series will touch on these questions from a variety of perspectives and from different contexts, mostly from the so-called global south. Um, and now I will introduce today's speakers. And I want to say here, it's very wonderful to begin and launch this series with an intervention by a group of people by a group of organizers, uh, thinkers, artists, um, and I think this really represents the uh, spirit of this series. Um, so the Grassroots Liberation Project is born of a commitment to social justice through documenting the social and ecological movement struggles. It seeks to empower community activists in the ghettos of Nairobi in Kenya in their valiant struggle against the many gross human rights violations being perpetrated by the post-colonial state and the brutal extractive model of capitalist development it is imposing. Uh, the project aims to embody and advance an ethos of true international solidarity to struggle with and alongside affected communities to help them empower themselves and in so doing to transcend indeed to burst asunder the narrow confines and neocolonial neo -colonial dialective of charity and dependence. So with us are uh, Gacheke Gachihi, who is the coordinator of Mathare Social Justice Center, a member of the Social Justice Center's Working Group Steering Committee, and a member of the Grassroots Liberation Movement in Nairobi, Kenya. He's involved in regional social movements and politics. Uh, Brian Mathenge is a community organizer from the Young Communist League, a member of uh, Githu Rai Social Justice, the Social Justice Center's Working Group, the Grassroots Liberation Movement, and the Communist Party of Kenya. Waringa Wahome is an organizer, a political theorist, social justice and human rights lawyer, a member of Mathare Social Justice Center, the Grassroots Liberation Movement, the Communist Party of Kenya, as well as the Kenyan Organic Intellectuals Network. And Don Wahenga is an artist, 
social justice activist and secretary general of the Wahenga Youth Group in Kayole, Nairobi. And also with us is Dr. Thomas Jeffrey Miley, who is an associate professor of political sociology at the University of Cambridge. And his work focuses on struggles for self-determination in the 21st century. He is co-editor with Dr. Federico Venturini of Your Freedom and Mine, Abdul Ojalan and the Kurdish Question in Erdogan's Turkey which was published in 2018. And he's a member of the executive committee of the EU-Turkey Civic Commission and a patron of peace in Kurdistan. So we're very excited to learn from you today and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Great, thank you. Thank you so much um, for having us. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, like I said, thank you, Delar, for inviting us uh, to participate in the seminar series, the lineup of which looks excellent, it is truly an honor. Uh, let me begin with a quote from a recent dialogue on method that I had with a colleague and collaborator by the name of Jihad Hami, where Hami insists, I think it is very crucial to borrow Cabral's wise phrase, class suicide, and to apply it to our dialogue on academics and academia as academic suicide. In other words, to achieve a truly liberatory social change, those academics who believe in social justice and freedom should orient themselves and their roles towards the purpose of social and revolutionary change and use their privileges in the service of activism and revolutionary educational awareness. I think there are two fronts in which those academics who, who seek a free and rational world must struggle. That is both inside and outside ac academia. In academia, they should foster critical and radical education and aim to bring the accumulated knowledge piled in and monopolized by academia to wider society. Outside academia, they should build new educational institutions which are societally oriented and deal directly with the problems in daily life that people face, in doing so seeking to solve and transcend them. What Hami speaks about here is in turn related to a concept closely connected with the work of Walter Rodney. That concept is called grounding. In the introduction to the recent Verso edition of Roddy's important early work, Rounding with My Brothers, Carolyn Boyce Davies defines the concept of grounding as capturing the rooted exchange of knowledge between the academy and the community without privileging the scholarly intellectual over the community intellectual. She further clarifies that Walter offered, uh, what, what Walter offered was a way of making knowledge serve the liberation of our communities from the oppressive European histories and epistemologies which seek to contain this knowledge. And she goes on to insist that the practice of grounding offers that ability to make knowledge real and allow it to serve our communities, to return to base as it were, to re-territorialize -ter our understanding of the world. Both Hammy's adaptation of Cabral's notion of class suicide, as well as the concept of grounding so closely associated with the work of Walter Rodney helped to inspire the grassroots liberation project, some of the main dimensions of which we would like to share with you here today. The Grassroots Liberation Project is dedicated to the struggle for self-determination or people power across the city's informal settlements, home to approximately 70% of the population of Nairobi. These settlements are characterized by a lack of clean water, sanitation, clinics, schools, roads, or adequate housing, as well as by periodic forced evictions and systemic extrajudicial police murders. They are sites and symbols of severe deprivation and state violence. The inhabitants of these spaces find themselves up against the merciless logic of capital in lockstep step with the brutal post-colonial state, according to whom they are but surplus to be constricted, confined, and controlled. In the face of these appalling conditions, the Grassroots Liberation Project seeks to defend the principles of community mobilization and self-organization. One important part of the Grassroots Liberation Project has to do with the documentation and narrative depiction of up-close encounters with the brutal injustices against which the residents of the informal settlements are forced to struggle. Prominent among these is the specter of extrajudicial executions. Let me share an excerpt relaying an up-close experience with the specter from my recent trip. The specter of extrajudicial executions. Wang Zhao was insistent that we had to pass by to pay our respects. What had happened to the family was unfathomable. They had just returned from upcountry where they had buried their grandfather. They were still wearing memorial t-shirts that had been printed out for the ceremony. Back in Mathari that very evening, their boy was gunned down right on Mau Mau Road in cold blood by the police. The community was enraged, Riot rioting had broken out. We came the next afternoon. The sun was beating down intensely. I could feel my neck burning. The air was thick with dust. We could hear a woman wailing as we approached the makeshift shack where the family resides. 
It was the mother whose cries pierced the sky. She was laying down on the ground, not far from her front door, writhing in pain, her head in the dirt. I looked away for fear that our eyes might meet, nor did I opt to go inside. I could not shake the sensation that I was intruding upon the scene. No comfort, no consolation could I provide. And yet the grieving family members and their neighbors certainly took note of the curious spectacle of an Mzungu in their midst. The following weekend, Wan Zhao and I accompanied the family back up country, this time to bury the boy. We stayed far away among a crowd of men as the casket was lowered into the ground. A line of attendees grabbed handfuls of earth, which they tossed into the pit one by one, while all the while the church choir belted out soulful songs. The soil was so red, it was as if it had been soaked in so much blood. The boys in the video were being hunted down, systematically eliminated. The video and the song were indeed, indeed audacious. The main rapper was a kid whose brother had been killed by the cops. He'd had enough and so, did, and so decided to speak out in his own way, in his own words, creatively through rap. And what did he come up with? A Shang version of fuck the police. The repercussions had proven brutal. The main rapper had managed to flee to Mombasa, but too many others had not been so fortunate. The boy whose funeral we attended was among the unfortunate. And on the way back, we were accompanied by another kid whose life was being threatened for the same reason. He was terrified and the people who we were with were looking for a safe house for him to stay after the cops had made it clear that he was next on their list. And what I'd like to do is just uh, share for you guys uh, uh, very quickly. Let's see if I can. Um, the, the video itself. Baruti, gang, Baruti, gang, Vitola Dina. Mambanga ni warazi, jeshi ni yo, yeah Warazi wakazwe, jeshi ni yo, yeah Kenya mede warazi, jeshi ni yo, yeah Warazi wakazwe, jeshi ni yo, yeah Jeshi ni yo, yeah Jeshi ni yo, yeah Gang, jeshi ni yo, yeah Gang, jeshi ni yo, yeah Juzi wali liyali kona nde Kumbe ni mezunda ndenge kwa keja Juzi wali liyali kona mbi Kumbe ni kunguni kwa kenena Juzi wali liyali mwaka Kumbe ni mekata maji Juzi wali liyali mwaro Kumbe ni kwati mwaroga Awa razi wa kwende Awa makara wa kwende Awa mabani wa kazwe Awa mabani wa kazwe Jeshi ni yo, yeah Jeshi ni yo, yeah Jeshi ni yo, yeah Gen, jeshi ni yo, yeah Gen, jeshi ni yo, yeah Wende kukwati ya warazi, atupende dressi kwa zao Wana uwa ma legend, wana acha wanyonge Jeshi ni yo, yeah Siyo kopi acha ni kifa bado mini legend Kwa menga siu sema rest in peace for the soldiers Atuwe ni sema rest in peace for the soldiers Wakwene, wana tudulumu Saja ingilia kati, mina onesha kidole cha kati Kora ongo, uangushe akina nani Kora uchote, mokoro wakina nani Wana tumada wakita kacheo Jeshi ni yo, yeah, gang Jeshi ni yo, yeah Mambanga ni warazi Jeshi ni yo, yeah Warazi wakazwe Jeshi ni yo, yeah Kenya media warazi Jeshi ni yo, yeah Warazi wakazwe Jeshi ni yo, yeah Jeshi ni yo, yeah Jeshi ni yo, yeah Gang, jeshi ni yo, yeah Gang, jeshi ni yo, yeah Ata ni kifa Bado mini legend Rest in peace, fallen soldiers. I pray this is the rest in peace, fallen. Fuck them. Okay, let me share now back to my other screen here. You guys can see this now, no? Yes. Okay, excellent. So this is the kind of state violence. Um, you can put it here. back on full screen. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. So this is the kind of state violence that the boys from the ghetto were up against. An undeniable pattern of extrajudicial executions that constitutes clear evidence of the criminalization of the entire community. Though the police seek to justify their inhumane, unconstitutional actions in the name of protecting the community against criminality, and in so doing, even manage to win over some support within the community, 
because criminality is, of course, a real scourge. It cannot be denied. But the root cause of such criminality is poverty, and perhaps more specifically, endemic and chronic unemployment. Fan Fanon spoke of horizontal violence in relation to the phenomenon of criminality to refer to the violence of the oppressed against the oppressed, even if it should never be forgotten who the real criminals are, that is, the big criminals, the ones with the powers to make and to manipulate, not to mention to enforce laws. But the grassroots liberation project aims to go beyond just documenting up close experiences with brutal human rights violations, or even amplifying the voices of grassroots activists engaged in struggling against these. Instead, it seeks actively to struggle alongside and to strengthen the movements with which it engages, to ground with them, and in the spirit of internationalism, to help them link up, to forge connections with freedom struggles around the globe, and specifically with the Kurdish freedom struggle, with which I have become closely associated over the past several years. To this end, during my visit, we organized a series of four seminars in coordination with the Organic Intellectuals Network associated with the social justice centers, in which we sought to provide some theoretical awareness of the contours and content of the project of democratic confederalism inspired by Abdullah Ojalan's impressive rearticulation of the principle of self-determination. We encouraged local activists to discuss the possible relevance of this new paradigm proposed by the Kurdish freedom movement to their local struggle. Moreover, alongside and as a complement to these seminars, we engage in grounding sessions with local grassroots groups in which we familiarize these groups with the figure of Ojalan, highlighting the significance of his abduction in Nairobi, and we introduce some of the core concepts of democratic confederalism, which we translated as people power. Below, I conclude with an excerpt which relays the experience of a particularly fruitful such grounding session, one with a group called the Wahanga, which is based in the informal settlement of Kayole. Grounding with the Wahanga. The space that the Wahanga youth group occupies in Kayola is something of an oasis. It is peppered with brightly colored political murals and features a reclaimed public square, a courtyard lined with trees and an abundance of plants, as well as a swing set for the children to enjoy. We first had the chance to ground with the group at, the, at this, their headquarters, from the late afternoon into the early evening on the last day of February. More than a dozen of their members had gathered to greet us. We sat in a circle and they introduced themselves, with each of them emphasizing a somewhat different version of the history and the purpose of the group. They had questions for me, of course. They were curious to know just why I had come. As we spoke, the sky successfully transitioned from hues of blue to orange to red to black. Just behind us in a corner up against the wall, a small fire was burning, barely controlled. The name Wahanga is the plural for Umhanga, which according to the Oxford Swahili English Dictionary means an elder who sits on a native council or who's trusted to give sound advice. In Google Translate though, when you type in the word Wahanga, it offers as its English equivalent simply ancestors or alternatively he saves. By all means, however it is translated, it is certainly an evocative way for a youth group to refer to itself. Over the course of the conversation, Kefa Gasaka, who goes by the name of Don Wahanga, and who is the group's current secretary general, distinguished himself for his eloquence and for his charisma. But he was not the only eloquent or charismatic one among them. Even in sometimes faltering English, the group's members were most impressive in their ability to express a quite sophisticated and deeply persuasive sense of personal mission and political vocation. Don's passion was palpable as he explained the origins of the group. Our struggle started off back in 2018. We were a number of youths determined to change where we stay. It was not a nice place. There was nowhere to relax. And we were imbued as well with a sense of ecological justice. So we decided that we could landscape this area. It was a dump site at the time. And there were syringes all around used by people who were injecting drugs here. But we transformed the place. Now the children play here. He paused, pointing to a group of children swinging on the swing set before continuing, you see, Kayole is a concrete jungle. There are no other playgrounds around here. By transforming this place, we made it safer for the children to stay. He smiled and his face lit up, beaming with pride. We transformed it for the benefit of the children, for the entire community. At this point, another member of the Wahanga, a guy who called himself Washington, chimed in to emphasize the importance of murals as central to what they do. He motioned towards a nearby wall, one adorned with elaborate murals. Where you are, as you can see, there are graffitis. They are beautiful, right? He stressed. If you're an outsider and you have never come around these parts, you will have no idea that such beauty exists around here. He thus made it clear that part of the purpose of painting the murals is to give the neighborhood a different image from the negative one so prominent in dominant depictions of it. But above and beyond that, there is a pedagogical purpose as well. He explained, I visit groups, I do the murals and teach them about what I draw. For example, if it's a revolutionary, I can draw Malcolm X. And after drawing Malcolm X, I write a quote about him. And if you ask me, what did he do? I then tell you the history of Malcolm X. So it's like educating people, you know? He next pointed in the other direction towards the entrance of the Wahanga headquarters before continuing. I did Sankara over there. 
Now, if you were a kid and you were entering there, you can see the image of Sankara. And, and we try to inform people about what Sankara said, you know, a community without liberated women isn't a liberated society, you know. So that's in part why we drew Sankara, to remind women that we are part of them, you know, that they are part of our struggle. His voice was emphatic now. He concluded, we use graffiti to spread the revolutionary message through art. I was certainly impressed with the quality and the content of the mur murals and indeed motivated to share with them an idea of mine. I told them, since you are mural artists, let me tell you about the leader of the Kurdish movement, a guy by the name of Abdullah Ojalan. He was kidnapped right here in Nairobi 23 years ago, and he's been in solitary confinement since then. They call him the Kurdish Mandela. Maybe a mural for Ojalan calling for his freedom would be good. It could send a powerful message of international solidarity. Yeah, we can do one, several of them replied in unison. But first, tell us a little more about this man, about his struggle, Don requested. So I did. Among other things, I told them that Ojalan was kind of like Deedon Kamathi, the bold leader of a freedom struggle, and that his capture in Kenyan not only served to expose the neo-colonial nature of the Kenyan state, but also created a potential world historic link between the Kurdish struggle and their own struggle. This led yet another Wahanga member to ask, what do you think is the best way forward for the Kenyan people, to fight like the Kurdish people? To which I replied, Ojalan says that it is time for the weapons to become silent and for words to speak. I think these words are relevant in Kenya. We need to have a people power movement, but a people power movement that works with soft power, for dialogue, for democracy, for peace. Peace, love, and unity came the refrain from several of the Wahanga members at once, citing a prominent Rastafarian motif. Over the next several weeks, it turned out, the Wahanga would paint not just one, but five murals of Ojalan. His face can now be found on the walls across the informal settlements of Nairobi, in Kayole, in Mathare, in Kasarani, in Kangemi, and in Ruaka. Needless to say, the Kurdish freedom movement was extremely moved by this gesture of international solidarity and has begun to follow with considerable interest the developments in the informal settlements of Nairobi. In addition, they have invited a delegation from Nairobi to participate in the upcoming 29th International Kurdistan Cultural Festival to be celebrated in the Netherlands this September. They are also planning for a Kurdish delegation to visit Nairobi in the fall and for a delegation of Kenyan women to visit Rojava, Rojava sometime soon after that. Let us hope that this is the birth of ever increasing collaboration between the two freedom movements. Okay, thank you. Um, so with that, Don Wahanga is here and uh, uh, he's, he's the mural, one of the mural artists and he uh, has some things to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Don from Wahanga. Uh, I'm the secretary of the group and the co-founder, uh, which is a community-based organization uh, located in Kayole, Nairobi, Kenya. It was formed back in the year 2019, uh, having, ident uh, having identified various challenges within the community, uh, such as inadequate public, public spaces, uh, lack of green spaces, and uh, uh, ecological injustices are being done as pollution was rampant, garbage was being thrown into the rivers, which are the natural sources of water. And yes, uh, the group deals with social, uh, social justice alongside ecological justice, thus championing for ecological change as the global warming is threatening to destroy the earth. Uh, being a youth-led organization, we strive to nurture talent and use them as a key tool to address our issues in the community, ranging from gender-based violence, which is really, it's rampant and happening around our, our areas and communities, which is the informal settlement of Nairobi. Uh, peaceful, uh, this year we are having our elections. So we strive and, and try to educate and uh, emphasize that it is good to have peaceful election. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a past that has, uh, has not been good. We have seen people being killed, property loss and so forth and so forth. And then there's mental health and mental health issues. Uh, we, we've seen people killing themselves, uh, committing suicide due to extreme poverty conditions within our informal settlements. 
governance and politics, extrajudicial extra killings, among other issues. And we do this through art, and mostly we, we are an art hub, uh, including musicians, a graffiti artist, uh, actors, name them, any kind of artist. We, we do beadworks and so forth and so forth. Uh, I'm also a freelance journalist and I am I'm, I was planning to document the whole the whole electioneering process from way from how it's starting up to the election and even post election and try to show and teach the community of how things are being done differently in the informal settlement of Nairobi. Yeah. And the, we are motivated by doing the arts because by self-determination, there is a question that I've seen there on the, by self-determination, we try to build our own workspaces where we strive and engage in our uh, arts activities. And therefore, we try to empower ourselves as youth from the ghettos and to, to champion and even we inspire other children to not do around us. And motivate other people around the community and synthesize them on civic education and other and other among other things. Uh, with that, I think I'm done. Maybe you can go to the next person. I got check it. Got check it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Sorry, I uh really improvising my place here. I really appreciate for that part. I hope you can hear me, comrade. Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. That's a very powerful uh, intervention, Jeff and uh, Don Wahenga. Very inspiring uh, uh, articulation on the struggle of um, uh, grassroots liberation projects, the Don Wahenga, the arts, uh, graffiti, all the work that's happening in the grassroots movement, especially using art to amplify our struggles and building up grassroots movements. And I start with the one from Mandela, that's very powerful, that we should not despair. We should uh, continue critiquing these um, uh, dominant uh, structures of oppression uh, as we continue to unify our struggle. I think it's very powerful starting with that. Uh, uh, we're doing this because many other people also are doing, are doing struggle everywhere. It's connecting our struggle from uh, Madare, Nairobi, uh, the struggle of Kurdish people, in the Palestine, all this this part of the global struggle against the capitalism and imperialism, and that's why we 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 are anchoring our our struggle on grass liberation, and also linking up with other struggles that are happening in the world. Um, speaking about the 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 the, the, the indigenization in Kenya and uh, social movements, uh, as you know, the uh, history of uh, Africa has been a history of uh, betrayal. Uh, the betrayal of the national project, which was organized by liberation movements after independence. Uh, it was very powerful. It was rooted in the grassroots movement. Uh, it, was, uh, it was led by peasants and a petty bourgeois. But after the independence, the, 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 the government was not able to de de construct any colonial states. And uh, from there, as uh, Professor Isha Shivdi has spoken on his book, Silence on NGO Discourse, uh, the, the defeat of the national project, uh, which was anchored by national liberation movement, uh, created an emergency of uh, NGO, non-governmental organization. But for this, uh, uh, in early 1980s in Africa, it is started with um, a structural adjustment program that the IMF and World Bank, uh, which demanded that the government sought being involved, being involved in um, delivery of services, that's healthcare, education, uh, housing, and all the best needs that the liberation, uh, the, the first government had, uh, had organized, the first independent government had organized, where they had in, uh, programs or social program for agriculture, housing, healthcare, services, water, all this. But in early 80, 1980s, the government were, were asked to move away from uh, providing these uh, uh, best things or removing government from providing uh, development for the people, especially on issues of uh, basic needs. 
So I, it's from here that we have an emergence of a non-governmental organization. And Professor Shift, is a shift to speak about this uh, on his book, Silence of NGO Discourse, where he talk about the NGO came in when they said they were, were non-governmental. Yes, they were non-governmental. Although they were not non-governmental because the majority of these uh, NGO are funded from a uh, uh, from, uh, uh, north, yeah, from uh, uh, imperial resources like uh, US, uh, um, Europe. Uh, so all these, uh, they call themselves non-governmental, but they are not non-governmental because they are, they are agency of uh, uh, foreign governments or they, they are funded from the overseas government. Now they say they also they are non-political, uh, which is 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 they 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 they, they politicize the space. So non-ideological, also they don't have a, an ideological uh, stand, and they are non-partners partnership, and that's the issue the, of them speaking about charity, and that's 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 the womb of w w how civil society in Kenya was born in. That, that the, the womb of neoliberal neo 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 economic order uh, starting from 1990. That's when the NGOs started registering in Kenya. Uh, and these NGOs, they, they were in the same uh, description as Professor Isha Shift has de described, non-governmental, non-political, non-ideological, and non-partisanship, and also uh, doing charity. And this is a, this is a, um, the situation we find ourselves when we 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 ushered in a multi-party democracy in 1990 in Kenya, we had a, a dictatorship of Mo, uh, Daniel Trotichera Moy, uh, which came after Jomo Kenyatta, and then we had a, a multi-party government. Uh, and in 2002, we had a um, a, a, a new liberal democratic uh, state-led government by Mwai Kibaki. All these governments uh, uh, are, are organizing within the framework of free markets and um, and um, and new liberalism. Uh, so, uh, so this is a situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, I myself, I worked with the uh, non-governmental organization, human rights organizations, for a number of years, almost 15 years. And I would feel like there was something that was missing. Uh, human rights. Theory has a lot of limitation. Uh, many times you cannot organize politically, and this is a, this is a situation we found ourselves, and that we start thinking that how do you spark a conversation from below, from the grassroots? As many human rights organizations was formed from the from the middle class level, and this middle class level uh, had come up from uh, from this uh, background of the of the of the uh, um, uh, economy that 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 was 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 supported by by neoliberal uh, economic forces which did not want a, a radical critique of a political economy and a majority of these they talked about civil and political rights uh, so there was no idea of talking about the questioning economy and uh, comrade jeff has spoken about the the impact of the police state and violence and and a criminalization of the poor the poverty and the hopelessness as a comrade uh, Don Wahenga uh, speaking about the challenges of the systematic extrajudicial killing. So all these uh, state violence, poverty, uh, they were not being interrogated in a, in a radical way and are asking uh, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Uh, so the human rights uh, would uh, document the uh, cases, uh, take them to human rights organization, refer them to human rights office in Geneva, but nothing much was happening. It was just uh, the usual documentation, the data, and nothing was happening. There was no a grassroots movement that was articulating the, 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 this question in a, in a broader way uh, and, and uh, trying to show that the, the human rights violation, the extrajudicial killing, the enforced disappearance, lack of access to water, lack of housing, uh, poverty, all these are related to the economic model that has been imposed to us by AMF and World Bank. And also the state, the state that you have is still in your colonial state. And that's why even you can speak about, uh, as, we, as we think about Comrade Ochalan, he was uh, um, uh, kidnapped in Kenya in 1999, and then uh, he was uh, sold to, to the intelligence of Israel and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Turkey. 
that, that tell you a, a, a colonial state that is controlled by imperial forces. And this is, a, this is a background of a state that we have in Kenya that cannot believe in a people's, a people's project or having an economic model that can liberate people. So these questions were ringering a lot in our mind. And especially us who are in the uh, foot soldier for, of the civil society in Kenya. And then we start asking ourselves, how do we create an alternative from below that is broader, although using the human rights discourse or the human rights theory, but broaden is the agenda and have a, a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift by having a, 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 a radical articulation of social justice. And that is the basis of uh, formation of Madara Social Justice Center in Nairobi, in formal settlement. Uh, the, 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 the distinction is that the, the mainstream civil society are based in the middle class. So it was a challenge and courage to establish a community-based organization with a character of human rights and social justice in the informal settlement. Because that's where there's a lot of human rights violation, intimidation by police, poverty, uh, violence. And then that's the courage of establishing Mother Social Justice Center in the informal settlement. It sparked the conversation of building up a social justice movement from below. And that's the basis where we started uh, uh, 2015, building up um, uh, a grassroots movement by starting using documentation of these cases, but not just necessarily is of creating data uh, to give to the human rights organization and, and legal legal uh, advocacy group uh, uh, in, in Kenya. It was, it was using this to spark a political education on why is this happening? Uh, and this has, has sparked up a grassroots movement. It's as far as mobilization and the, the thinking of, um, of uh, alternative way of organizing and also building up as a, a social justice movement that also linked with the progressive political party, the Communist Party of Kenya, which is also uh, analyzing the, the situation using a, a radical theory uh, as, a, a, as Marxist and also uh, using a lenses of Thomas, Thomas Sankara, uh, Walter Rodney, uh, as Jeff has spoken about, trying to rethink the, the struggle uh, that we are facing today uh, and following up the footsteps of Amika Cabral and, and, and many other African leaders who had a, a radical thought of, uh, of how to organize a African society uh, using egalitarian, uh, egalitarian way. So I can, uh, I can add there, so I can invite uh, Comrade Warenga and uh, Brian so that they can speak up uh, on uh, the emergency on a building up of the grass liberation project, which is has been laid the foundation by the, the social justice centers uh, working group and social justice centers that are shaping up in Madare, Dandora, Kayole, and many other sp spaces, uh, sparking up um, a social justice movement from below for alternative political leadership in Kenya. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Gasheke and Comrade uh, uh, Thomas Jeffrey and uh, Dawn, who've gone ahead of us and given a very good contextualization of um, social justice movements and the struggle for human rights, particularly here in Kenya, and the struggle of NGOism and uh, imperialism, of course, and the damage that is continuing to create in our country. Um, and of course, thank you very much, uh, to my comrade here, Dila, for inviting us to this session, and um, we appreciate it very much. And of course, uh, when we're speaking about uh, settling the question of the true nature of people's democracy, we must, of course, uh, look at a collectively mobilized social movements, which is, of course, structured um, to anchor the movement's uh, democratic control from below, as mentioned by the Sheikh. And of course, which must mitigate the influence of uh, neoliberal organizations, such as NGOs, and the elite political class and careerists, of course, who aim to create uh, personality cults, of course, a personality cult type of political leadership in social movements which of course those kind of movements are known to be devoid of uh, people's public participations, you know, devoid of complete people power and uh, people's decision in democratic debate and discussions, particularly on matters of social justice and political injustices that have been facing our country. So here, um, social movements, and in this case, as we speak about the grassroots liberation movement, uh, the aim here is to use political consciousness to connect um, social struggles with uh, political programs, of course, in demand of people's livelihood, like Comrade Don uh, before me had mentioned on the struggles of, you know, access to food, access to quality healthcare, access to quality education, to shelter, to basic needs of like clean water, 
and of course, uh, the struggle for liberation of Kenya, starting all the way even from the second liberation, uh, you know, the multi, multi against uh, multipartism, you know, during the second liberation of Kenya, and which, of course, we cannot say, you know, took the struggle to another level, although did not completely succeed succeed in the liberation of a country, but took the you know, the struggle for social movements and organized grassroots social movements, of course, even in the process of constitution making here in Kenya, you know, it took the process to another level. And although at the same time created a new search for, of course, alternative um, alternative ways away from mainstream NGOs and away from, you know, neoliberal organizations that have continued to be captured by the middle class elites. And of course, um, civil societies that are uh, pro-reform uh, civil societies. And of course, at the same time, um, you know, uh, the continuation has gone on to create uh, a very uh, organized social movement, for example, the social justice movements, which continue to organize people who've been politicized by their conditions. I think, um, you know, uh, Comrade Jeff's presentation on uh, how people have been politicized by their conditions. Here we have, for example, you know, women who have, um, you know, who have been women and their mothers and sisters who've been orphaned, of course, and other kids who've been orphaned. By, extra, by the struggle of extrajudicial killings. And these ones, they're coming together and radicalizing themselves and forming, you know, mothers of victims, for example, mothers of victims and survivors of extrajudicial killings. And of course, putting a political content to, to their struggle. And then we have, uh, where in, in a case where we have to connect and locate human rights and social justice activism, you know, in community grassroots movement, which of course, in this case, demands the construction of an organic community-based political instrument, which of course is gonna come up with new challenges. You know, taking for example, the grassroots liberation movement, which, you know, aims to transcend charity or the neocolonial charity idea of begging for money and, you know, connecting them with the, with the, with the struggles that comes with neoliberal borrowing. And of course, these ones are going to come with their own challenges because they cannot attract um, the usual donor funding from neoliberal sources because they are an independent social and very socially strong movement which is based in the grassroots which is based in below which aims to educate the masses of course and organize the community based on their popular struggles and their livelihoods and of course aiming to sharpen the, the contradiction the social contradictions that exposes um the, the exploitation of neoliberalism and of course at the same time we have to be able to connect the, the to connect and mobilize the peasant struggles and break away from neocolonialism. You know, connect uh, the fisher folks at, uh, in different areas of of, uh, of the rural Kenya, and then connect their struggles with the workers here in the urban setting. At the same time, recognizing the difference in their nature of organizing and the difference in the nature of their struggles, but connecting them in a political sense through conducting political programs, political education programs. You know, keep creating political consciousness that continues to that continues to emphasize the need for political organizing and um, I'll give my comrade Brian to go on and bring up the um, you know the historical contextualization and the breaking away from NGO um, thanks comrades and uh, for inviting us to participate in uh, this important seminar of a very critical question to uh, the you know the question of uh, you know uh, organizing and you know the question of uh, social resistance social organizing and uh, you know uh, uh, um, you know taking uh, the, taking a breath to uh, uh, the political activism you know so um uh, to my uh, comrades uh, jeff uh, gasheke uh, comrade warenga and don who have come before me have uh, uh, tried to expound on uh, you know several things on uh, you know that touch on uh, this important topic. Um, I want to start uh, you know by uh, saluting uh, you know by saluting this uh, forum you know, and bringing you uh, you know solidarity greetings from the Grassroots Liberation Project and uh, you know from uh, the, the the comrades from uh, the grassroots liberation movement you know which is a movement that has been inspired by uh, the you know has been uh, inspired by you know the concept of people's struggles you know uh, the concept of uh, you know solidarity you know and the, you know the concept of uh, breaking away from uh, you know the neoliberal uh, attachment to uh, to 
to to you know to imperialism. So the grassroots liberation movement, uh, you know, as comrades have handled, is a is a is a social grassroots movement, which is uh, you know a uh, 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 which is a, a mass led organization, you know, that has in, has been inspired by you know resistance struggles of our today society in Kenya. You know, uh, you know, uh, talking about you know access to uh, you know to to to. Uh, you know, social uh, necessities like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, food, you know, to land, you know, to the land question, you know, access to, you know, to, 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 to women emancipation, you know. So uh, this, uh, as Howard Zinn has, uh, you know, has, 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 uh, you know, has, as Howard Zinn has mentioned that, uh, you know, all these uh, social movements as, are inspired by, uh, by, 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 you know, by, uh, you know, social uh, necessities, you know, by uh, uh, resistance struggles, you know, that uh, uh, are, you know, that uh, are, an uh, are uh, an important factor in, uh, you know, inspiring the people-led movement. So the grassroots liberation movement is also uh, uh, inspired by, you know, uh, such conditions, you know, the extrajudicial executions, you know, the continued state repression, you know, the continued, uh, you know, a lack of housing, you know, and uh, such commodities. So uh, it is, uh, you know, it is inspired by uh, also, you know, the, it is inspired and organized in a uh, three dimensional uh, outlooks you know that uh, the first uh, the, the first thematic area touching on the socio ecology because we understand that you know socio ecology is the basis of uh, our struggles you know and integrating you know these campaigns with the women question and uh, you know the 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 people power concept you know and uh, you know uh, uh, so uh, comrades have talked about the activities that the grassroots liberation project uh, aims to and of course uh, it has uh, an attachment with the you know with the with the with the people struggles with, you know within the social justice centers you know advocating for such uh, you know uh, uh, advocating for 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 you know uh, such uh, measures and concepts so uh, what you understand you know and the similarities of uh, these uh, you know of these movements in the historical concept is that uh, they have been all, you know they have been always inspired by you know the concept of uh, the class struggle you know that uh, there is a, a continuous struggle you know even within societies uh, as comrade gasheke had expounded you know on the, the you know on the kenyan concept of uh, the historical struggles you know and uh, this is uh, uh, you know these are a connected uh, conversation all along that uh, the people power has uh, the internationalist uh, aspect all along because you find that our society uh, as Marx expounds is that it is a society that has been built you know by you know the you know has been um, you know the, the history of all societies the history of class struggle so you find that you know within uh, it, it is within these conditions that uh, these social movements are birthed you know and uh, and established and developed so uh, first that kenya is a class society and uh, you know it is these conditions that uh, you know that give the political characteristic of uh, the social movements so uh, the social movements also in kenya uh, you know uh, you know that uh, a factor that has led uh, you know uh, the motivation of the grassroots liberation movement is that uh, they have been you know they, they you know they have been um, you know they have been developing either a, a reformative you know a reformative or a revolutionary uh, you know angle which of course uh, we understand that with the spontaneity of the social movement something that uh, we acknowledge uh, you know that even with the spontaneity uh, you know they, they are important and you know both reformatory and uh, revolutionary programs that you know are you know are led so we are also inspired uh, by by uh, you know, by a program, a revolutionary program, you know, giving it a revolutionary touch, you know, that, uh, you know, we also acknowledge the, the, the importance of the reformative uh, aspect uh, of the social movements in, uh, in uh, you know, in Kenya. So uh, you get that uh, the emergence of the social movements have been, uh, you know, have been have been inspired by, you know, either a, a reformative or a revolutionary aspect. So uh, and uh, you know we you, you, we get that uh, the globalization, the international globalization, or uh, you know, with the neoliberalization of market. You know, with the you know, uh, of course, with the you know, with, uh, the neoliberalization of market gave rise to you know the rise to NGOism, you know, uh, in Kenya and all over the world. That uh, these markets that uh, you know from uh, I had Gasheke mentioned that from uh, the, the, the you know even the state allowed the, the registering of NGOs in Kenya. 
So uh, from when they started advocating for these concepts, you know, whether healthcare or housing or uh, you know these, uh, you know the, the the you know the state, uh, you know the state pro the state provided, you know the state provided necessities. Since then, the you know the state ne they provided necessity. They have never you know brought solution to such. So you find that uh, uh, then you know the, uh, these are also the the factors that are necessary. Uh, you know the neoliberalization of market is also a factor that is necessitating the emergence of NGOs. You know that uh, uh, the NGOs were born you know from the mouth you know from the from the womb of uh, neoliberal uh, neoliberalization. So um, uh, we have uh, we, you know we have uh, identified these as a key factor. And you know, with the grassroots liberation movement, we have been running a number of uh, you know seminars, you know, to continue advocating on more revolutionary programs, you know, and to draw the line on uh, you know the reformative programs. You know, we have uh, been holding uh, the class struggle very dear. Uh, that is, uh, you know, we acknowledge that a, a key active ideological weapon is the only weapon, you know, to liberate our people, you know, and to inspire the people power movement. And uh, of course, uh, we have been advocating, you know, with Jeff and also others, uh, you know, others that uh, there is the role of organic intellectuals, and uh, you know, you're using these institutions as centers, you know, to build people power and you know, to build the liberating cause. So uh, the, the our people power is also advocated by 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 uh, by uh, a strong factor of uh, of internationalism and uh, you know some of the factors that are affecting the sustainability the the you know the, the question of NGOism and uh, you know uh, is uh, you know the sustainability of uh, these social movements you know the, uh, so we are insisting that uh, this sustainability has to be led by you know concepts like uh, you know uh, the communal you know the communal approach at, uh, as its uh, philosophical foundation you know through communal uh, contribution you know you know uh, bringing up you know and uh, of course reversing the erosion of uh, the intellectual or revolutionary characters of uh, this movement Comrades had talked about the concept of class suicide. You know that that those uh, you know within uh, those that are uh, not within our class should also also you know provide something you know to keep the revol uh, the revolutionary force going. So um, uh, thanks to the refugee study group and uh, receive our solidarity. And uh, you know um, uh, we it's an important topic that uh, we 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 need to 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 talk about. Um, um, Okay, so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm told I still have some minutes. So uh, I, 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 I need also to talk about the, you know, the- There, I, I, there, may, be, there may be question and answer. The, the, there may, oh, I, I don't know okay. what the situation is. Okay, okay, yeah. so I think I, I, think I can- point. Yeah, go I, ahead. I, oh, I, so, okay, so I, I think from the sustainability of the economic, uh, from the uh, sustainability of the social movement, that is a key factor in the conversation and uh, you know and uh, you know taking the approach of uh, you know communal uh, you know communal contribution in uh, sustaining the social movements you know upholding the you know the spirits of internationalism such uh, you know that was practiced by the grassroots liberation project when uh, when uh, when uh, comrade uh, you know uh, thomas jeffrey was here and of course, linking with the uh, international programs and uh, of course institutions, you know, social institutions as this one is, uh, uh, you know, is, a, is an important approach to, you know, to, to getting to, 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 to this. Uh, so the, among the, the, so the, the erosion, the intellectual erosion that has been happening as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, as uh, a factor that is, as has been brought by the NGOs and the such is that you get, uh, you know, that opportunism, you know, erodes, you know, within the ranks of uh, social movements, you know, and of course diluting the mass movement, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, it brings a lot, uh, you know, it brings, uh, you know, ideological rifts, it brings, uh, it, it brings um, um, uh, uh, dilutions of uh, the revolutionary campaigns and uh, of course the, the, the programs, but uh, uh, I think uh, with the approach of, you know, of course, and uh, uh, the threat of dependency that has been created by, you know, uh, the, the, the question of dependency that uh, of course is historic and it happens, uh, you know, to be inspired or, or uh, you know, to be, to, be, to, to be attached to the state question because uh, um, uh, the, you know uh, you know the state is of course as Gasheke mentioned is uh, you know relies on uh, uh, imperial powers 
or you know is uh, a you know uh, is a stage for imperial powers to you know to keep going so um uh, the question about dependency is also colonial you know and it has all you know, always been in a class society so uh, these are uh, factors that of uh, we 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 also need to 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 debunk uh, to demystify and uh, that is the purpose of the grassroots liberation project uh, because uh, you know to allow for for questions and answers i will want to end there and uh, thanks for the comments for thank you so much uh, to all of you really this has been such an inspiring uh, collective presentation of the work that you have been doing. I feel the love and solidarity that is bringing um, us all closer together towards a world in which we can struggle for justice and liberation together. So thank you so much. Much solidarity and love uh, for the work you do. And hopefully uh, we can continue amplifying and connecting uh, these struggles. So I'm just going to mention also um, Mohammed and Naim who is going to speak next week uh, on 11th of May uh, at 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, or starting 5 p.m. UK time uh, on a materialist account of patriarchy under the post-colonial state. And he's going to, I'm just going to read the abstract. Uh, women were at the heart and uh, continue to be at the forefront of decolonization and the struggle for self-determination. The promise for self-determination often came hand in hand with a commitment by national liberation movements to uproot and overthrow patriarchy. Yet, just as neocolonialism re-entrenches itself in the post-colonial state, so too did the domination of women remain a fundamental pillar of so-called post-colonial sovereignty. This lecture will seek to explain how the structural necessity of patriarchy has not been overcome by decolonization. And of course, uh, so many of you have um, emphasized the importance of struggling against uh, patriarchy in the struggle for liberation. So we're all very excited for uh, Mohammed's talk. So I really do sincerely hope that you come next week as well. Uh, everybody uh, who has joined us, especially from Kenya today. Uh, once again, on behalf of the Refugee Studies Center and uh, the department, I just want to express my deepest gratitude and say that uh, your talk will be on YouTube uh, very soon and hopefully it will reach even wider audiences. And in the meantime, much solidarity and lots of love uh, your way. Thank you all very much for coming and hopefully see you next week. <laughs>